this uh, talk starts with a massive spoiler because I've already told you what the end is, right? Like I'm going to arrive at a, a multipartite maximally entangled state and I'm going to construct the resource theory that's going to give me that such a state. And much like in this novel, it starts with someone dying and the whole novel is about reconstructing why and how the person died. Um, anyway, so um, I'm going to start at the very basic, uh, we know that um, entanglement is useful because it gives us stronger than classical correlations and we can use these for many applications like transmitting information efficiently and communicating blah 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 blah. Um, that's great. And the thing is we can't create these correlations in spatially separated laboratories and we usually use local operations and classical communications, classical communication as the paradigm of the things we can do in spatially separated laboratories, okay? Um, and because we can't create entanglement um, in, like, well, this is exactly the case when we want to use the entanglement that we, we've already created, right? And because this doesn't generate entanglement, we can build it as our free operations, and we can say, well, okay, if I'm given state psi, but I need state phi for my protocol, maybe I can convert psi into phi using LOCC, in which case I will say that psi is more entangled than phi because it's more useful, right? Um, whereas if I can't do it the other way around, if I'm given the less entangled state but I needed the more entangled state, I'm a little bit stuck, okay? Um, and the good news about bipartite entanglement is that this structure gives rise to a resource theory of LOCC. Um, and it, it there is a maximally entangled state from which I can reach all others. And so regardless of which state I need, if I'm given that one, I know that I'll be okay. Um, and that's great. And there's a very good characterization of when I can move from state psi to state phi, and it's got to do with majorization, and it's all in Nilsson's paper. Um, and that's great for bipartite entanglement. Um, okay, so because it worked, let's move on to tripartite entanglement and let's define the same thing. Um, and this is when I'm moving away from Barbara's talk, maybe. Um, and so I still have LOCC between the participants and they can communicate in pairs. Um, and I'm going to see where this leads me. But now there's bad news because, um, well, first of all, we need to make sure that the technicalities are covered. Um, there are two different kinds of entanglement in tripartite uh, systems. I need to distinguish between fully separable states, which are um, states that can be written as a tensor product um, of each party. Um, and then there's biseparable states, which is pick a partition and it's separable along that partition. Um, and then finally, there's genuinely multipartitely entangled states, uh, which are those that can't be written as a tensor product across any bipartition. Um, okay, so just this is gonna be relevant in a minute. Um, but in the, the bad news about using LOCC to define our resource theory of tripartite entanglement is that I can't have a maximally entangled state. And why is that? Well, um, there's, first of all, there are two classes of states, and there are they are both generally multipartitely entangled. But I can't go from states of the GHZ class to states of the W class with LOCC or vice versa. And it's worse still, even if I allow an arbitrarily large error, I still can't do that. So there's no way that I'm gonna define, that I'm gonna be able to define a maximally entangled state, even if I allow for probabilistic transformations. Um, but okay, fine, because there's a brick wall between them, I can say that's not a problem, right? You can define an order on the left-hand side and a different order on the right-hand side. And you know, at least you'll have done something. And yes, that would be very nice, except we can't do that either, um, because there are isolated states, which are those that can't be transformed into any other state, and no other state can be transformed into them. So still, like I have states that are hanging out there in the wild, which I can't order, can compare to any other states. Um, so I'm a little bit stuck, um, and it's, it gets even worse because this isolation problem is generic when either the number of qubits or the dimension is larger than three, um, so that almost all of the states in my um, state space are isolated. So there's really no hope of putting any form of order here, starting with LOCC. Um, and that brings us to the question, is there 
a resource theory of, uh, of entanglement with a maximally entangled state of three qubits. How can we propose to find one? Well, as I said, yes, you've already read it in the title, um, but let's pretend we don't know this, and let's see how we're going to arrive at this. Well, first of all, I'm going to uh, need to define some different free operations, because the ones that we had before are motivated physically uh, by the things we can do in separate laboratories. But now, you know, you, you think about how this is structured, and you realize that this is not the largest class of operations that leaves your set of separable states invariant. And it's exactly what Barbara pointed to. Um, sometimes you define your free operations first, and you deduce your set of free states. Other times you do it the other way around. You define your set of free states, and you uh, pick the free operations the as the largest class of operations that leaves that state invariant. Um, and in entanglement, it, well, it used to make sense to do it the first way around, and now that we've hit a brick wall, we've done it the other way around, and let's see what that leads to. Um, okay, but again, because there are two different types of entanglement, we're going to have two different classes of free states, and hence two different classes of free operations. And first, we're going to start with full separability preserving operations, which are, as the name clearly indicates those that leave the set of fully separable states invariant. So I'm allowed to do anything that keeps me within that set. And I'm not going to define my maps in any mathematical way. I'm not going to do anything with them. I'm just going to say a map is allowed if on input a separable state, it outputs a separable state. If you input some separable state and it outputs a non-separable state, not allowed. That's it. That's my only restriction. And so I'm always within the green set if I start within the green set. Of course, if I start outside the green set, different things might happen, and that's the whole point of having these free, free operations. Um, and so let's recall what happened with LOCC. Um, we had two different classes of states, which we couldn't go between even probabilistically, and we had isolated states, uh, which are these guys over here. Um, and let's see how this changes with full probability preserving operations. Um, and the good news is that there's no inequivalent entanglement anymore. So if I have uh, a state, I can probabilistically transform it into a state of a different class, always. Um, so if I allow for error, then there's only one state space. There are no two classes. And also there's no isolation. So if you give me a state, I can always find you a state that's less entangled than it. So I can always find you a state and a map that maps the input state to a different state, and that's why it's less entangled. Um, the only issue is that there's no maximally, en maximally entangled state still. Um, and I'll get to the details of the proof at the end. I just want to give you a very general idea first and leave the maths until the end, while, uh, by the time we've all got an intuition for what's going on. Um, so there's no maximally entangled state. If you give me the GHZ, there are states I can't go to from it. And similarly, if you give me the W, there are states I can't go to from it. Deterministically, of course. Um, but there, I mean, the, this brick wall over here is slightly shorter than it was in LOCC because there are states in the other class that I can go to. So I can go from the GHZ state to a less entangled W class state and vice versa, I can go from the W to a slightly less entangled state in the GHZ class. So we've done something, but I'd like to keep looking, right? Because, well, for a start, we haven't met the title yet. Um, and it'd be nice if we had a maximally entangled state. So what are we going to do? Um, we're going to take the other class of entangled states as our resource states. Um, can we do better? Um, so before, we left the green set invariant. And now we're going to leave the blue set invariant. We're going to get biseparability preserving operations as our free operations. Again, we're defining them completely artificially. Uh, we're just saying, this is my set of free states. I can do whatever keeps me within this set. Um, and in a way, this is a resource theory about genuinely multipartitely entangled state, which is quite nice, because these are meant to be like the actually useful states in, in multipartite entanglement. Um, so this, it's kind of nice that it does work for this, uh, for this setting. Um, so where I had full separability preserving, I now have bi separability preserving operations. Um, and again, we start with LOCC just to get our bearings. And obviously, we're going to keep all of the advantages that 
uh, filter probability preserving gave us because our FSP, filter probability, is included in the bicep probability preserving operation, so we're going to keep that. But we can do better because, for a start, um, all of the states in the W class can be reached from the GHZ class, so that's great. We've already found a maximally entangled state. From GHZ, I can go to any other state. Um, and actually, the math is quite simple, and we'll get to them at the end. Um, and also, I mean, we need to bear in mind something that I've kind of sweeped over in the talk so far, which is that we can't define... So for, to define an ordering, we can't be talking about states. We have to talk about classes of states. Why is that? Because if you give me state psi, and it turns out that I can go to phi by the free operations, and I can also go back from phi to psi, deterministically both ways around, then there's no way of comparing them, right? Like the, they have to both be equally entangled because they're equally useful. If you give me one of them and I need the other one, I can always go from my state to the one I need and back. So there's no reason why we should separate them in our theory. And so here, there's a huge class of separable states because all of the bi-separable states have to be in the same class. And by the way, we're, because we need convex uh, convexity for the reasons Barbara pointed out, um, we need uh, mixtures of biseparable states along different partitions to also be included in this class. So in a way, this class is huge, um, and the picture looks kind of like this, and now the dots represent classes of states, and so we have one big biseparable state, and then a bunch of genuine multibutted entangled states, which are not maximally entangled, and the big uh, GHZ class. And this class, again, is quite big. It's expectedly bigger than in LOCC, uh, than the GHZ class in LOCC. And for example, it includes graph states. And graph states are some states that are apparently very useful in quantum computation, as some of you might already know. Um, and they're defined, well, the GHZ state is the only graph state for three qubits. But if you up the dimension or the number of parties, you get a gazillion um, number of graph states, and they're all maximally entangled, which says something about th the theory, maybe, right? Like, we've hit a class that's already useful, so maybe the operations aren't so artificial. Ten or five? Ten, okay. Um, and so, again, um, just to know what we've done with the, with the bicep probability preserving operations, we have no an equivalent entanglement, because we already didn't with filter probability preserving operations. We have no isolation, for the same reason. Um, and I can convert the GHZ state deterministically into any other state by these bicep probability preserving operations. And the nice thing about this is it's valid for n qubits. The proof just goes the same way for three qubits than for however many um, particles of however many dimensions. Um, so this is quite nice uh, formally. And some of you might be thinking, yeah, all right, um, you seem to have hit the right class of states because you know you've hit the ones that are useful in computation. And, and that's great, but I don't really trust your operations. You seem to have defined them artificially. And I think that's a fair criticism. Why not? Um, and indeed, this is motivation for future work, which is we want to find out whether our operations um, can be implemented with fewer quantum resources than you know, global unitaries or whatever. Um, at, because if this is the case, then OK, this resource theory starts to mean something operationally as well as theoretically. But in the meantime, we might also look at measures to quantify all this, because these measures might be useful in whatever context, regardless of how physical the operations are. And this has been seen before in other resource theories like coherence. You can quantify coherence quite successfully, even if the operations seem artificial in some ways. Um, OK. so. Maybe, yeah, maybe before we get to the maths, if there are any questions about the intuition, we can deal with those now, and then I can run through. Yeah. So, yes, to clarify, these operations are not universal, are they? Uh, yeah. How do you mean universal? For quantum computation. Oh, uh, I am not fully up to date on quantum computation, but I think they're not. <laughs> uh, let's talk about it later. Okay, sure. <laughs> Any more questions? Cool, let's go to the maths then. Um, so as I said, we're not saying anything about the maps to start with, but we need to define them somehow. 
Um, and this is not the unique kind of map that meets our properties, but it's a very useful kind, and here's what we're doing. We're inputting state chi, and state chi, all it's gonna do is it's gonna give me a number, and I'm gonna obtain that number by tracing with the GHZ state, and, and so in the end, I'm gonna have a convex mixture of state psi and a biseparable state, which I'm calling rho bs. And this convex mixture is gonna be either separable or entangled depending on how much noise I'm adding. So what I'm doing is I'm getting psi and adding noise to it. And if there's lots of noise, then the output is gonna be biseparable for sure, right? Because I'll, I'll have like drowned out the entanglement in psi. Whereas if there's very, very little noise, then the state will be entangled still, if psi were entangled to start with. Um, and if I input the GHZ state, so if chi equals GHZ, then this, this map gives me psi deterministically, no problem. And the only thing remaining to be proven is that this map is actually biseparability preserving, right? So, because of that, I'm always gonna assume that chi is biseparable, because I forgot my map, I'm just gonna prove that it's of the right kind. Um, so, um, well, there are a couple of measures that we're using, and one is the so-called geometric measure of entanglement, which is this overlap. So this what di dictates how much noise I'm adding to the state. And the other one is the robustness, which measures exactly what I said before. How much noise do I need to add to my state before it becomes biseparable? Um, and well, if you do the maths, and bearing in mind that this thing has to be normalized, um, you come up with this relation, which is quite simple to to come up with, and we need to check what the geometric measure of the chi is and what the robustness of the psi is and compare them. Um, and it turns out that the geometric measure is related to the eigenvalues of the chi. Well, if you want the maximum overlap, take the maximum eigenvalue of it and you'll have the maximum overlap with a separable state, right? Because the um, eigenvalues are gonna give you all the separable states and the, um, yeah, and the maximum, when you overlap, the, your state with the one that gives you the maximum eigenvalue, that's your maximum overlap, right? Um, and it turns out that this is always less than or equal to one over the dimension for all biseparable states, so that's quite nice. Um, and the robustness is also related to the eigenvalues in some more convoluted way, but it came out in the first robustness paper, um, well, first paper that defined the robustness, so that's quite nice. And again, um, it's quite simple to prove that this is always less than or equal to d minus one. And if you put this over here and that over there, it turns out that this always holds, um, and so we're happy. And you might be wondering, if the proof is so simple, what happened to the fully sep full separability preserving operations? Why couldn't we do the same thing, right? Um, well, it turns out that these nice expressions only work for biseparable states because they come from the bipartite entanglement um, idea, and so what we're doing is saying, okay, well, before we had two particles, now we have two sets of particles, but it's basically the same thing. Whereas with full separability, you can't do that because you no longer have these nice relationship between the measures and the eigenvalue. So you've got to do it all by hand. And um, well, first of all, I mean, the way we approach the proof is we wanted to find a measure that would give us the right answer straight away. And why a measure? Because we want, we like the measures that don't increase under the free operations, because this give, this, these measures in a way respect the ordering of the, of the resource theory. And um, as I said, they might be defined differently for biseparability and full separability preserving operations, because if you've got to mix with noise, what do you want to achieve? Is it full separability or biseparability? Or if it's the maximum overlap, then what kind of states are we overlapping with, biseparable or fully separable. Um, and, and so, well, these measures of entanglement, the idea behind them is that if the measure of phi is less than the measure of psi, then I know I can't convert phi into psi. Um, and these are called monotones, in case you've heard of the word. Um, and we knew that the geometric measure of the W was larger than the geometric measure of any other state. And the hope was, well, maybe if we can find a different measure that is higher for the GHZ than for the W, we'll know that there is no maximally entangled state. Because we'll know that because of this argument, we can't convert anything into the W. So if there is a maximally entangled state, it is that one. That's the only candidate for it. 
Um, and if we have, say, the robustness being higher for the GHZ, then I know that I can't convert anything into the GHZ either, and that's it. I don't have a maximally entangled state anymore. However, um, we computed the robustness, and after a bunch of work, we found that they were equal. Um, so we were sad because it gave us no new information. We didn't um, achieve what we wanted. But on the other hand, along the way, we'd gained quite a lot of insight. And we were able to find an explicit obstruction to, um, to the map that would uh, transform the W into specifically the GHZ. And if the maximally entangled state, or the candidate thereof, um, can't be mapped to at least one state, then it's not a maximally entangled state. And the proof was finished. Um, cool, okay, so just to recap slightly, in bipartite systems, LOCC gives a very wonderful ordering, and there's a maximally entangled state, and that's kind of the gold standard, and if you're given that one, you're happy. Uh, not the case for three qubits, the picture is a lot more messy, and for n or d, so the number of qubits or the dimension larger than three, uh, this is generically trivial, so there's no hope of doing anything here, and hence we've expanded the class of free operations, and we started with false probability preserving operations, and we found that, yeah, it's a non-trivial theory, but there is still no maximally entangled state of three qubits. Um, and then we moved on to bisoprobability probability preserving, and bingo, we found a unique multipartite maximally entangled state, as announced. Um, so I'll be happy to take any questions. Any questions? Yes. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you have more than three parties, right? Mm -hmm. So why just why do you restrict to by to by separability? Well, then we so by separability is going to give you the largest class. So you're going to be left with only genuinely multipartitely entangled states as your resource, because bipartite is the largest class of but separable. But by separability with respect to any cut that you can yes. possibly have. Yes, exactly. And the reason we approach this as what's the largest class of operations that we can have is, well, if we don't find a maximally entangled state with those operations, then I know that I'm done. I won't, ha mm -hmm. I won't have a maximally entangled state ever. And so we know that for any resource theory of entanglement in tripartite systems, that's it, we're done. There's no theory that, um, there's no maximally entangled state in any resource theory where the set of fully separable states is, le is left invariant. Yeah. Whereas now we can do whatever, what you're saying, which is reduce the class of operations to different partitions and different numbers of parties um, for n units and see what happens, yes. Thanks. Uh. Yeah, can I ask just one final question? Mm. So, uh, do, do you have uh, understanding of invertible operations in, in the class of those three uh, operations? Are they just unitaries or much? I mean, more? unitaries are definitely invertible. We don't have any other sense of, well, I mean, you don't. <laughs> okay. So um, can, can I just, like, my motivation is like you, yeah, for maybe. entanglement, you have like those SLO CC classes. Yeah. For instance, when you, you know, uh, yeah, the, I was wondering, like, for can, can there be, like, and there is a lot of work on this, so, so would it be possible to extend what you're doing here to, you know, study, um, yeah, how to, how to, uh, how to phrase it, like, other, something analogous to, to SLOCC somehow? I mean, you can have probabilistic or stochastic uh, BSP, yes, that's fine. Um, it's not fantastically useful for BSP because we've already done it with deterministic operations, so, you know, um, maybe SFSP might be useful, but I'm inclined to think that because it's just different kinds of operations that we're defining, it's better to go deterministic while you can, and only when you, um, when you can't do anything deterministically switch to probabilistic. Um, but maybe we can talk more later, because maybe I'm missing something about this. Sure. Uh, thanks. Cool. Okay. Maybe one final uh, quick question? Thanks, that was a nice talk. Um, just a question, so now, for the by separability preserving operations, you would need to allow things like n minus one parties can share entangle, entanglement. Any, 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 any subset of n minus one parties can do so, right? Mm, I'm not sure, so, d well, maybe finish your question. And so, so the question is more like, um, how, uh, 
how can we understand physically the restriction that would create such a class as opposed to let's just agree that we are not going to create a maximally entangled state but otherwise we can share entangled with any subset of n minus one parts. Yeah, absolutely, and that's exactly what we're working on right now, so I don't have an answer to your question, but hopefully in the near future we will. Um, the idea is maybe we won't have to go to, anyone can do anything, and so the theory would be trivial in a sense, um, but we can say, so this is a wild conjecture that's not um, mathematically sound at all, but maybe we can say, if we share entanglement in pairs, we can do BSB, but we can't do global unitaries, for example. So we want to have a criteria uh, of that kind of, mm, we don't need full quantum communication between everyone, but we obviously will need something more than LOCC. And the lower that uh, those requirements, the better. <laughs> okay, so let's keep on the questions for the coffee break. Let's thank Patricia again. Mm -hmm.